Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 83 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how are you doing? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good, my friend. Very good. So we're going to dive straight into part one. There's no changes. It's always the same thing here on this show. We're going to start with the review part. We're going to start with a card that happened last week in Germany. Uh, one fight to mention on this bill. Vincent Feigenbutz, he moved to 26 wins. Of course, the two losses as well on his record. He took on a last-minute replacement opponent by the name of Norbert Nemesapati. He's the Hungarian um Super middleweight, you know, I think he was the Hungarian champion a while back. His record 25 and 5 going into that bout. He lost unanimously over the 12 rounds. So Vincent Feigenbutz retains his IBF Intercontinental Super Middleweight title. Uh, Norbert Nemesapati is a former opponent of Callum Smith. I remember they fought, uh, I think we had Callum Smith on our show the week of that fight, actually. So that's how I remember his name. Moving over now from Germany over to Mexico. One fight to mention on this bill. Uh, two fights to mention on this bill, actually. A young, um, unbeaten prospect, 15-0. and 0, His name is Avni Yildirim. He took on Marco Antonio Peraban. Obviously, Peraban, former opponent of James DeGaul. This one was for the vacant WBC International Super Middleweight title. Peraban was knocked down in round 11, but he did manage to see the final bell. So it... Went down as a unanimous decision win to Yildirim. So I don't know too much about the young guy, but he now moves to 16-0, and and it's an impressive scalp for his record. Top of the bill over there was a female, Jessica Chavez. Her record at the moment is now 29 wins, 4 losses and 3 draws. She picked up a unanimous decision win over 10 rounds and retained her WBC World Female Flyweight title against Anna Arizola. Who had a record of 26 and 11, now 26 and 12, three draws as well. Moving over now to another part of Mexico, this one at the Arena Oasis in Cancun. Now, I'm not claiming to be any kind of, you know, expert on female boxing, but I will say there was a woman by the name of Zulina Munoz who had a record of 48 and 1 with two draws, and that's a really big record for female boxers. They I don't really think that they go on to 50 fights plus, but she has. And she actually lost to a person who's got a record of 14 and 9. So that's huge right there. Uh, she was also the WBC World Female Super Flyweight Champion. The name is Zelina Munoz. So she lost to Guadalupe Martinez Guzman. So uh, that's a strange one there. We don't we don't really see that too often. A person forty eight and one losing to someone who's fourteen and nine. Um, but yeah, it was a unanimous decision loss there for the champion, and Guzman becomes the new the new WBC champion. Of course, as I said, at super flyweight there in the women's side of the sports. That's it for Mexico. Moving over now to the Barclay Card Arena, formerly the NIA, Birmingham, West Midlands, United Kingdom. It was a big bill this one, obviously on Sky Sports. Um, I'm going to start with the undercard. We're going to start with Josh Kelly's fight. Um, we, of course, saw him last month. We saw him go the distance in his debut. It was a six-rounder. Uh, this fight, you know, he fought the Spaniard. The Spaniard came over to win, a winning record as well. He boasted 6-1. and one. Josh Kelly did the business on him. He was down... In the fourth round, the Spaniard, Josh Kelly, uh, got rid of him. I think the referee waved it off in round four. So a good win there for Josh Kelly. But we'll be speaking to him in a matter of moments. Just when we get through the review part, we'll be speaking to him. So we look forward to that. We'll say we'll say more on this fight when, when he comes on the phone. But that's it for that one. Moving up the undercard now. Frankie Gavin picked up a points win over eight rounds against Reynold Garrido. Reynold Garrido, 18 and 14 with one draw. He's been over to the UK a few times. Frankie Gavin, obviously, Coming off that loss to Sam Eggington, uh, really, you know, he needed to impress. He didn't really do that, Frankie Gavin. I mean, he picked up the win, but it was just, I think it was, um, there was one point in it. So, 
or well, one round in it, you know, like it was it was two points, I suppose, a two point gap. But if one round would have gone the other way, it would have gone to to Garrido, then we'd have seen a draw. So it was a very very close. It was too close for Frankie Gavin. I don't know if. Um, the eight rounds, it just being an eight rounder, did him a favour. I think maybe if it was ten rounds, it might have been a little bit more suited to him. But you know, he's a good friend of mine, Frankie Gavin. But he knows it himself. He didn't impress there, and I don't know if he needs to go down to one forty or whatever it was. But you know, it wasn't very impressive, and he knows that himself. So all the very best to Frankie Gavin, of course. But you know, we need to see him in in better fights than that. We we need to see him win fights easier than that. He's a very technically gifted fighter, but, you know, at the moment, I'm not too sure what to say about it. Moving up the undercard, Lennox Clark, he was 15-0 and with no blemishes. He's now got a draw on his record. He drew over eight rounds against Carol Horsajek. Um, that's that's not actually a female called Carol. That's a man, by the way. His record was 8-7 and seven with two draws, so not a great not a great out in there for Lennox Clark. Also on the bill, Sean Davis was defending his WBC International Super Bantamweight title against Gamal Yafai. This was, well, this was always going to be a pretty decent fight. Both men were undefeated. Davis was down once in the third round, twice in the fifth round, and three times in the seventh round. He was game, Sean Davis. He went down every single time he went down. You know, I wasn't sure he was going to get back up, to be honest. It was the body shots that were really... You know, really affecting him. He really couldn't take the shots to the body, especially the way Gamal Yafai was ripping in with them. So, um, you know, a good win there for Yafai. But Sean Davis, definitely, I'm going to give him some credit. He kept getting up. You know, he barely had anything left when he was getting hit with some of these shots. All the, you know, all the air was being punched out of him. But he managed to get back up, so he showed a lot of heart there, but he just didn't have enough. And, you know, that was it. In the seventh round, it was all over. So a good win there for Gamal Yafai. He picks up the WBC International Super Bantamweight title. He also proceeds to 12-0. and And Sean Davis picks up his first blemish now, 12-1. and Also on the bill. Seferino Rodriguez. He was being managed by Sergio Martinez. He took on a friend of the show, Sam Eggington. We had Sam on a couple of weeks ago. We knew that this was going to be a step up. And what I mean by that is we know that Sam Eggington's a guy who, you know, we all know his story, walked into the gym, wanted to be a journeyman, just wanted to earn a bit of money, and there's no stopping him. He is a wrecking ball. He is the bulldozer. That's what I'm going to start calling him. Forget calling him savage, Sam Eggington. Even though he is a savage, he is the bulldozer. And, you know, he only fights one way, Sam Eggington, but he overwhelms people. His fitness levels are incredible. He just keeps coming forward the whole fight. Um, You know, he seemed to... I didn't really think he was in too much trouble during the fight but there was a spell where I remember the commentator saying that he thinks that um, Sam Eggington was hurt and then Sam landed a great shot on Rodriguez and he looked like he was about to be stopped Um, but he couldn't get him out of there I think Rodriguez had pretty good recuperation skills Um, you know he, he was able to his legs were strong after a few seconds he was able to move well and when he was moving well he was actually fighting pretty well I don't think Sam Eggington's fantastic with movers but you know there's no stopping Sam Eggington he's now the EBU European welterweight champion of course his WBC international title was also on the line so he defended that but he becomes the European champion and as he said he said to us a couple weeks back that he will be ready in his opinion to fight for a world title in the new year and if you'd have said that maybe two years ago, or maybe just after the Bradley Skeet fight, maybe, maybe even as soon ago as that, you know, people, I don't think people would have liked that. I think people would have probably laughed, you know, but there's no stopping him. The man just keeps smashing down the tasks, the seemingly impossible tasks in front of him. And I will say credit to John Pegg as well, his trainer. Um, when Sam stopped Seferino Rodriguez in the 10th round. It was a brutal, brutal KO. I think he was actually, you know, unconscious pretty much two punches before the fight ended. He was out on his feet, completely gone. He was on his way down and he got hit by two serious punches. I think it was like a, like, you know, like a left and a right. So, you know, he took a right, he took a right beat in there and he pretty much, I mean, he fell out the ring. He pretty much landed on the ringside photographers, which we don't like to see. And he was completely out. There was a bit of concern. Sam Eggington, you know, he turned around, he was celebrating a little bit, not over the top, but his trainer jumped straight in. As I said, John Pegg, the first thing he did 
was went straight over to Seferino Rodriguez and checked on his welfare. So I think massive, massive credit to John Pegg. But a great win there for Sam Eggington. He just keeps marching on. There's no stopping him. I mean, Barry Holmes was talking about fighting Danny Garcia next. You know, that's a huge step up. But I tell you what, the rate he's going at, you just you just don't want to bet against him at the moment. But Sam Eggington now 21 wins, 3 losses. Seferino Rodriguez 24-2. and two. But a brutal, brutal knockout there for Sam Eggington. Absolutely amazing. And also, main event, Cal Yafai defending his WBA World Super Flyweight title in his hometown of Birmingham. His record was 21-0 going into that fight, and he took on Suguru Maranaka. We didn't actually know how he was ranked in the top 15. He hadn't fought for any kind of WBA title, you know, like a regional kind of title, or, or perhaps, you know, a continental title, or anything like that. But he was just, he found himself within the top 15, so I'm not sure how. But, um... You know, he came and gave it a go. He did come and give it a go. He was game, you know. It was it was obviously a big fight for him. And I think he was possibly a little bit better than some people gave him credit for going in. But, you know, we've all got to admit we didn't really know anything about him. But, no, he came. He, he gave a good account of himself. Cal Yafai had been deducted a point in the eighth round as well for repeated low blows. Maranaka was down in the second round. So, um, you know, that's a 10-8 either way. But no, you know, he got the job done, the Afi. It wasn't the most entertaining fight, but, you know, he got the job done, as I say. But um, the Afi, you know, he's he's a class fighter. We know that. I just want to see him matched against some, some, some of the other good guys in the division. I'd like to possibly see a unification for him soon. So his record now, 22-0. He gets his first defense of the WBA World Super Flyweight title. So fantastic stuff there for Cal Yafai. Moving over now to the... Rival show, I suppose, at the first direct arena in Leeds. This one, a Frank Warren card over in Yorkshire, United Kingdom. Top of the bill, Josh Warrington. He took on Kiko Martinez. Now, it was a little bit annoying because both cards were scheduled at the same time, so it was hard to watch, you know, to watch both of them. I was taping both of them. I was I was flicking back and forward. Um, Josh Warrington picked up the win, is what we, you know, is what we should say. It's short and sweet. He defended his WBC international featherweight title. So uh, he's now 25 and 0. Kiko Martinez, I, I know that he's done. I know that he put a good, you know, he put a good account of himself in there. Some people actually going as far to say that Kiko Martinez won the fight. I didn't score the fight. I don't even really think that I watched the fight in its entirety. But, you know, he's done, and he came over. And I, I predicted a stoppage on last week's show, and I kind of forgot that Warrington can't really. I don't want to say can't punch, but he's not a big knockout artist or anything like that. He barely he barely gets his opponents out of there. But I actually thought he could perhaps overwhelm Kiko Martinez a little bit. Well, it wasn't to be the case. He managed to win a majority decision over 12 rounds. Um, one judge giving it a draw and two judge giving it to Warrington. I think both judges had it 8-4 to four in favour of Warrington, which even though I wasn't scoring it, that seemed a little bit far-fetched. A few people agree with that as well. So... Um, yeah, I mean, it's a scalp for the record, but I don't think... I mean, I, I liked the fight going in, and I suppose I'm a little bit of an after-timer saying this, but, you know, hindsight's a great thing. But Kiko Martinez was obviously not a great opponent for Josh Warrington. Josh Warrington's being mentioned in the same breath as Selby, as Scott Quigg, as as Carl Frampton. Carl Frampton did a job on this guy. Scott Quigg did an even better job on this guy. Selby, I wouldn't even want to see him fight this guy. He'd just take him to school. Kiko Martinez was a good fighter. He's not anymore. And Josh Warrington going the distance and some people saying, you know, one judge giving it a draw, some people saying that he was lucky to win that fight. That has not done him a good favor there at all especially his first fight with a new promoter so many people came out the uh you know the the atmosphere was electric the crowd were good but not very impressive there for josh warrington and he will know that kiko martinez now 36 wins eight losses and one draw i'm not sure what's next for him but he keeps going back to spain having all these weird six round fights against complete journeymen i don't know why he does it but he'll probably go and do that i suppose but um all the very best to Kiko Martinez. He seems like a nice guy by all accounts. Moving down the undercard, Jazza Dickens, 22-2. and two. He took on the undefeated 20-0 and 0, Thomas Patrick Ward. That's the brother of Martin Ward. Not Martin J. Ward. Martin Ward. Um, this one was, of course, for the British Super Bantamweight title. Jazza Dickens... Uh, he didn't start very well, in my honest opinion. I think that Ward started the better of the two, um, but it was a bit strange. Ward suffered a cut above the left eye from an accidental head clash. 
um, which was in round nine. I didn't even think it went as far as that. I thought it was maybe round five or six, but um, that's shocking me looking at that. But no, you know, he picked up a cut. It was weird because he kind of got thrown to the canvas by Jazza Dickens. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't in a bad way. He just... They they kind of just brushed bodies and he, he fell to the floor. It was it was strange. He went down with some force, but there wasn't any um you know any fouls or anything like that. It was just I think maybe he might have threw a punch and missed or something. He went down, but I think he he maybe caught his eye on on something. Uh, it must have been Jazz's head or whatever. But no, a brutal cut opened up straight away and it went down. Well, they had to go straight to their scorecards, which meant it was a technical decision. And Thomas Patrick Ward got the verdict, but the fight was. One of those fights where it was kind of um, momentum swings, you know, like Jazza Dickens was coming on strong at the at the point of the, well, the premature ending, you know. So I feel a bit sorry for Jazza Dickens, you know, he's he's only lost the two fights to really good opponents, Kid Galahad and Guillermo Rigondo. But this one, I'm sure they'll probably get it on again. I think Frank Warren will probably get it on again. He doesn't mind a rematch when fights are close, which I give him a lot of credit for, actually. So we do want to see that rescheduled. It was a good fight anyway. But yeah, Thomas Patrick Ward gets another win, I suppose. 21 and 0 now. Jazza Dickens 22 and 3. But he'll be, you know, he'll be kicking himself because he's been out for quite a while and, um, you know, he hasn't won now for, for, for over a year, so he'll be annoyed with that. But moving down the undercard, Josh Lever picked up a win over Phil Sutcliffe Jr. I actually thought that the stoppage was very premature, but it was a TKO in round six. It was for the vacant IBF Intercontinental Super Lightweight Championship. Josh Lever picks that up. He's now at 12-0, and and Phil Sutcliffe Jr. 13-2. and It was a shame, though, because uh, the referee definitely stopped it a bit too early. Everybody thought that. Uh, Steve Bunce didn't agree, but for me, I think that was it was really, really early. Uh, Tyrone Nurse was also on the bill. He actually fought Andy Keats. Andy Keats is a guy that I remember fighting O'Hara Davies. O'Hara Davies made easy work of him. Um, Tyrone Nurse went in the distance with him. It was only scheduled for eight. Tyrone Nurse was also cut on the forehead um, during the fight from a head clash accidental. So, um, yeah, going points. I know that... Nurse, again, is not really a huge puncher, but going points with Andy Keats, who I think O'Hara maybe got out within within about four rounds or so. So, you know, and it wasn't a defense, again, of Tyrone Nurse's title. I was pretty surprised to even see him on that bill. It wasn't shown on the tele, on the telecast, but, um, yeah, nonetheless, a win, I suppose, there for Tyrone Nurse, 35-2 and two with two draws. Andy Keats now 12-7. and seven. Nicola Adams was also on this bill. It's always good to see her out. She was in, well, she was in a four-rounder, four three-minute four rounds, but she didn't need them. I know that Frank Warren wants to, you know, extend the rounds and all that, and, yeah, she didn't even go the distance this time. She got her opponent out in the third round. Her opponent was very game as well, came in with a winning record of 5-1, and one. came to give it a go, but, you know, Nicola Adams put her beating on her to be completely honest I'm a big fan of Nicola Adams a great win there for her at super flyweight so she's now 2-0 and as I said a TKO in round 3 of 4 um, Zach Chelly was on the bill as well we talk about him because he came out to the Sopranos theme tune he deserves a mention for that alone he moved to 2-0 and with a TKO in round 2 uh, his opponent was down once in each round the first and second also uh, I, I believe sustained some sort of ankle injury as well but he had a winning record of four and one now four and two so a good win there for Zach Chelly. Bob Agisaf was on the bill as well he picked up his 17 win inside 20 fights against Joseph Abloso I don't know too much about him but he had a you know, he had a terrible record actually six wins and 36 losses now with three draws it was a points win there for Bob Agisaf I want to see him in with a few guys domestically there's a few guys at the domestic level I'd like to see Bob in with to be completely honest you know some Someone like Isaac Chamberlain. I think that's a brilliant fight. But anyway, that's it for the Leeds card. Moving over now to a fight that happened over in Massachusetts, USA. We didn't know that the fight was going to be happening last week, so we didn't talk about it. Um, it was really kind of like a last-minute thing. It wasn't even listed on box rec or anything, but friend of the show. In fact, I go one better than that. Real, real good friend of the show. Spike O'Sullivan. Gary Spike O'Sullivan, of course. He fought in the Plain Ridge Park Casino against a man called Chauncey Fields. 
season. Now, Chauncey Fields was only 4-2, and two, so um, a little bit harsh on his team for taking the fight. I'm not sure why they wanted to put him in there with someone like Spike O'Sullivan. Spike O'Sullivan, obviously a knockout artist. He lived up to that here. He picked up a KO in round two. It was scheduled for eight. He didn't need the eight. So Gary Spike O'Sullivan now 25-2. and two. I do want to see him in with somebody that we know about rather than, I know he sells a lot of tickets in Massachusetts, but we want to see him over in Britain, we want to see him in the big fights with our, you know, our guys domestically, to be completely honest, but no, I can't knock him, a great win, he seems to like round two, I think Gary, Gary Spike O'Sullivan takes people out in round two more than most, so, um, good win for him nonetheless, and also moving over now to the final card we've got for the reviewing, a 48-year-old James Tony picked up a win in what was his 90th professional contest. He KO'd Mike Shepard, who is about 41 years old or 42 years old. He's a terrible fighter. He's way past it. I'm not even sure he ever had it, actually. But Mike Shepard would stopped in round six. I didn't watch the fight, thankfully, but James Tony. Again, picks up his 77th win. He's got 10 losses and 3 draws. And it was for the vacant WBF World Heavyweight title. So if that was a genuine world title, he'd actually be the oldest heavyweight world champion. But it's not. So um, I think the it still lies with George Foreman. So uh, yeah, it is what it is. That was the review. And we finished there with... Uh, you know, a fight between two guys with a combined age of 89. But um, rather than all the old guys, we're going to bring in our first guest. I said it earlier, it's it's a breath of fresh air. It's one of our guys coming through, of course, coming through that GB setup, a youngster, a young prospect, undefeated pro. So it's now time to welcome our first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Team GB 2016 Olympian and, of course, unbeaten professional Josh the Pretty Boy Kelly. Josh, welcome to the show. Yes, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, pleasure to be on. Hey, it's my pleasure, my friend. So, Josh, first things first. Um, you've had two fights now so far in you know in the space of two months, if you like. It's been it's been pretty quick. Both of them have been live on Sky Sports. So I'm going to go back to the first fight. The first fight obviously was on April 15th in Scotland against Jay Byrne, in which you won on points over six rounds. Uh, that was obviously the first time you were able to showcase some of your skills as a professional. What did you make of that fight, Josh? The guy obviously came to fight, which is always good to see, especially for somebody's uh, debut fight. Yeah, it was, it was a good, it was a good fight, mate. It was hard. It was, um, it was quite, it was quite tough. He was, he was obviously durable. He'd um, completely that middleweight, and obviously I'm, I'm coming down the welterweight. I think towards that, towards that sort of. So that that sort of end of things. So I mean, um, it was tough and it was durable, and it, it, it gave us a good six rounds. And it wasn't a, like like you said, it wasn't a, um, a typical debut opponent. So I mean, I was I was I was happy with my performance. And, and uh, to be fair, early I heard him in the fifth round, and and early um, and early end up having getting them out. So I was I was happy with overall performance and um, moved on moved on quickly. I was um, back in the gym straight away, like you said. Have another point the next one. So, good. so you jumped straight yeah. into a six rounder, as I said, which we don't see very often. You went uh, the distance in in the, in your first out, and as you say, you had him hurt in the fifth. Yeah. But I just want to really ask you, how did it feel going the six? And obviously, the procedure of transition from amateur to pro, it's usually a thing which takes quite a few fights to see amateurs yeah. turn over into that pro style. You you look at your performance, you did not look like it was your debut. You looked like you'd had 20-odd pro fights. It's almost like that transitions uh, non-existent for you so I basically want to ask you about that and also you know going the six rounds as well what did you make of the whole thing yeah mate it was um, really good that, 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 that's a good compliment I mean I felt as though I, from the amateur background I was more I, I boxed more of a pro, pro style anyway I, su- I suited more of a sort of professional style so I've got my hands quite quite low which a lot of people um, some people like some people dislike but it's the way I box I've got, I've got fast reaction, so I just try and um, I try and I try and work off that a lot of the time. And obviously, um, the six rounds I boxed the worst knee once, and that was a five round leg against the, the world champion from Kazakhstan. So I mean, I, I wasn't I wasn't I'm not shy on doing the rounds. I'm, I'm fit, so I'll, I've been grafting away in the gym non-stop with that, and, and uh, the six rounds are no problem. But I'm loving the professional, loving the professional ranks. Uh, I just love everything about it, the ring walk, the, the glitz, the glamour, 
the shorter the more the, the more short attention you get, you, you get a little bit more short. You put the work in, and, and, and you pay for, you get to pay for it in the ring. It's, it's nice, it's nice feeling, and and how much as you go under look sometimes because you're in different tournaments, um, fighting fighting really hard cases in um, different countries, and no one really is about it. But at these professionals, you make a, I make a noise straight away, so I really enjoyed it, and I am I can't wait to step up the rounds and. I've got a lot more fit today, so I can't wait to get through these rounds and start to look towards the um, championship rounds, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. And we all know that you were supposed to be on the Wembley bill, but you didn't get a chance to get on. I bet you were pretty gutted about that, Josh. Yeah, I mean, I was I was gutted, but like I said, I said um, on the weekend, a couple of people were asking. I mean, it was a massive, massive bill to be on, and it, it was massive for the likes of Anthony Joshua, never mind up-and-coming boxer who's just turned over so I mean it was it was mainly a night for him but if I could have snuck on there I would have been I would have been really happy but it was it wasn't meant to be and I mean hopefully in the future it's got it's got to be some big fights there I'd rather be on the, on the card and hopefully in in the um in the far future I could be I could be headlining there never you never know so <laughs> I'll have to see yeah absolutely and also, you fought in your second pro contest this this weekend, just gone in Birmingham. You fought another guy who came to win, and he was tough. He took a lot of shots. Ultimately, your class prevailed. You got him out of there in the fourth round. What did you make of that one, Josh? Yeah, well, like you said, it was tough. These lads aren't fighting. It's got like they've only they've only lost one fight, if that. So I mean, they, I think they both the both combined records is yeah, ten fights lost two and. Uh, that that would be a difficult fight for someone to take in itself, and obviously I took two fights with only the opponents, lost them one, one each. So I'm looking. Adam's looking to move was fast, and like you said, he was tough and durable. So I just got I got to show me punch variety and skills, and that's what that's what I like to do. I like to um, go go through the let the tour the first few rounds, and then see if I can sort of hurt them later on. Like. You look at the good boxers these days, such as um, Lomachenko, etc. They don't have massive knockout punches, but they sort of wear them down over the rounds, and then they, then 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 they get to them, and they do end up hurting them. I think that's what my sort of boxing's got to be more about. I've got a, I've got a hurtful punch, but it's more it's more the fact that I, I wear you down, making you miss, counting you, and constantly being your face, and um, just making you miss by little inches, and it, it it's not more tiring missing than it is hitting so once once you get hit back with a hard shot then the, the rounds accumulate and you get more down but um it's not not very nice so that's what i'm not going to do and obviously that's what i did with him i got i got him out in the fourth and that's what i was looking to do with um jay burners obviously i tried to i tried to get him in the fifth but it just, that's what i said the longer rounds will probably suit me a little bit more and um, moving about and in making the mission count on them and then um eventually try to take them out so but, uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying it, and that, that was a good, that was another good fight, another good step up. Yeah, the you know the style of overwhelming opponents. It's always it's always it's always good for the eye. It's always good to watch on. Now I've got to be honest, Josh, you're under the tutorage of Adam Booth, as we all know. If I was a pro, I'd go with Adam Booth because I think he's brilliant. But my honest yeah. opinion of yeah. your first fight, especially, and some people will probably disagree with me, but you fought. A lot like a young David Hay. Now I know that you're only a welterweight, or just just a little bit above in terms of weight. But the style you showed, it was exciting. The left hand was low. You were popping the jab out. The footwork was good. It was entertaining. Do you yourself see any similarities, or has anybody said anything similar to you? As what I'm saying now, did has anyone else said that you had you you looked yeah. a bit David Hay esque in there? Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, it's that Adam Book sort of style, isn't it? And yeah. I mean, I. I've I've grew up with that sort of style. I mean, my dad, my dad taught taught us that sort of style since since day one. So I'm I'm um it's just it's just a matter of grooving that now since since I've moved to moved to obviously Adams where he's letting he's letting his flow. And like you said, David A. is uh he was he was the sort of biggest he was the he was the biggest founder of that. So it was good, it was, it was good to get compliments like that. It's massive. So I, I'm. I'm enjoying the compliments and I'm just soaking them all up. It is where it is, and if I can be compared to David here, that's something special. So um, obviously, style-wise, it's, uh, it's not a bad thing, and uh, I've, I've had that a few times, like you said. Yeah, 
it definitely is exciting. Now, a little question also on the training techniques at Adam Booth's gym. How are you finding the type of training and the intensity of it all compared to training in the GB setup? Obviously, we know that Adam Booth, you know, he's, a, he's very serious when it comes down to training. I'm sure... I'm sure I saw a video. He's got some kind of crazy punching machine, which about 12 different pads light up, and you've got to hit a certain pad what lights up at the time. He's, <laughs> he's got some crazy machine like that. Yeah. What do you make of that machine? Do you like that machine? <laughs> yeah, it's all about reaction. So it just, it just speeds your reactions up. And to be honest, um, I, I think Adam was a top scorer on that. So I think he's been practicing on uh, practicing by himself on it <laughs> while we've all been out the gym, believe it or not. So it's a bit, a bit mad. It's, it, it is it is toy, so to say. So it's a bit crazy, but we all go on it and we all have a good competition. It's it's, it's, got, it's everyone's competing against each other, and that's what you need in a gym just to bring yourself on. So yeah, it's, it's a good machine that we always end up on it at the end of the session. After a hard, it doesn't matter if it's a hard session or an easy session, we all end up on it, killing ourselves to beat each other. So it's good crap. <laughs> and after your fight. The, the weekend just gone. Adam Booth said that this is just a stepping stone on your journey to become world champion. He's obviously got a lot of belief in you. Despite your visible talent, it's a big call this early into a pro career. It means that Adam clearly expects huge things of you. And it's also refreshing to see you fighting guys, as you said, with winning records rather than people with 190-odd losses on their resumes. We don't really like to see that too often. I don't know if a plan has been put in place for you just yet, Josh, or if you're able to reveal anything about it, but do you feel that you'll be fast tracked into British level or perhaps beyond that? I'm not, well, I, but I can't reveal too much now. <laughs> of course, of course. No, I mean, obviously, Adam, Adam, Adam believes in me highly, and obviously, I've got belief in myself, and I had belief in myself before when Adam spoke. Adam's sort of confidence and what he's installed in us now has just, it's just boosted me. It just boosted my belief twice as much. It's, it's a bit mad. He rubs off you and he gets in your head. And that's what you need for a coach. And then, it, it, and obviously, he doesn't, he doesn't lie about things. He's always true. He's always truthful and strip things apart, bad or good. So I know when he says things like that, he's, he's, he's telling the truth. Because I've, I've heard him say, I've heard him rip, rip things apart and strip them down. And when I first went to the gym, different little things while I've been practicing, we, we had, to, we had to sort of just start the basics all again the way he wanted them laid, his foundations and stuff. So. I, he is. He is. Uh, he, he won't. He won't beat around the bush. He is truthful. And when he said that on the weekend, I was sort of took back by it. When I listened to it over again, I watched the fight and I listened to the uh, interview after, and I didn't. I didn't really re realize he actually said that until I listened to it after, because I was when I was sitting there, I didn't really click on. But um, yeah, it's a massive compliment that coming from Adam was such experience, and the boxing what he's got now as well, especially. So. But, um, it's good to hear that and it just installs belief in me and I feel as though I could be fast track if if need to be and um, that's what I want. I want to get fast tracks in the, in the sort of the British level and stuff. So I'm not getting ahead of myself. I know where my I know my talent is and I know what I've got to improve on. I know my mistakes and stuff, little switch offs. And like people say I do switch off a little bit but as the competition goes up I'll naturally I'll naturally switch on because I'm sparring with the best the, the sort of world champions, ex world champions gym anyway so and I know I know where I know where I lie there so I'm looking forward to the future hopefully it'll be great yeah, me too, my friend, me too. Now, you're next out on the 23rd of next month, if I'm not mistaken, in a little bit of a homecoming for you, for yeah. you, I suppose, in, in Newcastle, <coughs> this one. Do you know who you're fighting yet, Josh? Or has it not been confirmed yet? Um, it hasn't been confirmed yet. There's a couple of names floating about, so we'll just see, you, um, we'll just see you, uh, the line-up and then we'll take it from there. I mean, it's like the same as every fight. It's just, it's just another fight to me. It doesn't matter if it was in the back garden or... And NGM or like you said Newcastle a little bit of a homecoming so um, it's a fight to me and I just I just I just love fighting I want to just get in there and uh, do another number so yeah of course see. And obviously, you've had the two fights in pretty quick succession. You've got a third one lined up, no opponent yet. How many times, ideally, would you like to fight this year, this calendar year, Josh? Ideally, um, I think we'll get this one, and I think then this, I'm not sure. If, I think I'll have a, a bit of time off in the summer, and then that'll be my little break, and I'll be back in from obviously September, October time, and then just see what Eddie's got lined up for us then. But I think I was scheduled to fight six or eight fights in my first year. So we'll see if we can get anywhere 
near that, but obviously I'm fighting six rounders and I'll hopefully move on to eight and ten soon. So, and uh, we'll see where we end up at the end of the year. So it's not like it's not like baby fights where I can have a four round after four round after four round, and sort of just build my way up. These six rounds and eight, eight and ten sort of take a little bit more out of you. So you just got to be, um, we got to, we got to move, we got to move fast, but we got to just do things right. So. I'm looking for I'm looking forward to it and see what see what happens, see what Eddie's got lined up for us and Adam and um see who's see who's I wanna be fighting towards the back end of the year. And you're gonna be fighting at is it well away you're gonna be fighting at properly, Josh? Uh, I think I'll get down I think I'll get uh, come down to well away so we'll uh we'll, that's that's the plan but um we'll just I mean, shoot I'm I'm not I'm not a small I'm not a small well, the way I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite a big well, the way, but yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not like a small super brother. So I just class myself as a big well, the way, but not a small super well, the way. I'm not small for super well, the way. So I'm, it depends if I can, if I can, if I can do well as a well, the way, and see how far we can take it there. You never know, I could jump, jump in between the two weights, and that would be nice. So that would be a nice little touch. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of fights, especially domestically for yourself between the two weights. Now, um, Josh, I want to ask your opinion on one fight coming up again in the welterweight division next weekend, of course. Kel Brook against Errol Spence. This is a fight that everybody's looking forward to. Have you got an opinion on that one, Josh? Yeah. Um, my opinion keeps changing every every other day. You know, I like, probably like probably like everyone. I've seen um, a little clip of Kel Brook on a pad. Uh, today, uh, but just before I come on the f- phone, then and he's he's looking sharp, and I mean, he's looking really sharp. I mean, Elbow Spence is is such a talent as well. He's young. It might it might I'm not sure. I mean, Brook's strength and maturity might play a massive part in this, and that's what, uh, my opinion, that's what I think could could win him the fight. And he's sort of power, maturity, and strength, and I think that I think that will that will prevail, but. Errol Spence's quality he does everything really good and he's, he's really rounded, well rounded for for like a young a young prospect. So he's he's coming through and he's uh, he's it's not gonna be an easy fight whatsoever for Kel, but I can see Kel winning I, in my opinion, I've always rated Kel highly, so I can see him winning with it. Uh, if he finds the gaps and finds the shots, I think he can he can put um Errol Spence away. I've never seen, really seen Errol Spence against a massive puncher yet, I don't think. Anyways, like like you Kel but quality wise. So we'll just see how it goes, see how it plays out, but it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a really good one. Yeah, it certainly will be. I, I have to agree with you. I, I think that Kel hopefully gets the job done. We certainly hope so. And finally, Josh, just before I let you go, I wanted to give you an opportunity really to give a shout out to anybody, sponsors, trainers, promoters, anybody in particular. Just take it away. Right, go on. Well, um, I just want to have basically a main shout out to everyone who comes and supports us week, uh, week in. We out for obviously it's when they come down and buy the tickets and stuff. And the little the little sponsors well, not little the big sponsors such as J D, they help them massively. Um, Match Room, Sky, the coaching staff, everyone. I mean, uh, without them I wouldn't be where I not the cliche but I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am today and obviously the family where I've got behind is back and it's um, it's massive so I just want to say get your tickets for the twenty third and um, make it a good night in Newcastle so be sweet. Absolutely, my friend. Okay, listen, Josh, I'd like to thank you for giving us a piece of your time. It's always great to speak to a promising prospect such as yourself. Best of luck for your fight next month, and we'll no doubt catch up again soon. Yes, thanks, mate. Have a good one. Cheers, boss. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the preview part. But before we get into that, as always, we're going to go over to Ayaz with the latest news from the boxing world this week. Paul Smith will challenge Tyron Zhu for the WBA World Super Middleweight title next month. Yeah, um, you know, Paul Smith, he's been in... Is this his fourth crack at a world title? Now, as Is it his fourth crack? I know he had the two oh, fights it's with third. Abraham. It's the third. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, I think Sauerland, I think they're the guys behind Tyrone Zwig, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, another, another promotional um, deal with the Sauerlands. Again, I don't want to knock Paul Smith, but... You know, when you go back to his last proper win at 168, I can't even re- remember who it was, to be honest. So, um, you know, he's a good fighter. He's a good fighter, but in some ways, I think he kind of thinks that he's a lot 
you know, a lot better or bigger than what he actually is. But I'm not knocking him. I think he's a good guy. You know, I've, I haven't met him, but I've seen, you know, I've seen people speak about him in a good light. I've, I've, well, I've never, I say I haven't met him. I've, I've never spoke to him. I've seen him. I've been in the same room as him. He seems like a nice guy. But um, yeah, you know, we wish him all the best. At the end of the day, look, he's a Brit. You know, I want him to do the business. I wanted him to do the business against um, Arthur Abraham both times he fought him, and the first fight was very close. But you know. He's been out the ring for a while as well now, so I'm not too sure what he's going to offer. I don't. Uh, if I if I am not mistaken, the last time he fought, I think it was in like a six rounder on an undercard, and he didn't really look that impressive. I can't remember. I'm not looking at his record or anything, but I'm guessing that was it. So, um, I mean, hopefully he does the business. That's all I can say. But yeah, that's the open and shut of that one. Really, I hope he I hope he brings back a world title, and I actually want all the Smith brothers to become world champions. So you know, hopefully he does that, and it means two out of two or two out of four I should say have done it and uh, the other two will hopefully follow in you know in the near future as well Derek Chisora's WBC civil heavyweight title fight with Robert Hellenius on May 27th is to be rescheduled due to a number of contributing factors yeah it's a weird one they say a number of contributing factors we don't really know what that consists of but um you know I was looking forward to that I think there's a lot of fights out there for Del Boy he also he also seems to make some strange decisions like why I know that there's you know he had the fight before with Hellenius he should have won the fight he got robbed I understand that he wants to avenge that loss fair enough but it's not like he can go around avenging all the losses on his record you know like he's never going to avenge that loss to Tyson Fury you know I don't really know why he started trying to get this fight now maybe he tried to get it years ago when he you know when it when it was all fresh maybe I could be wrong but I don't really see the point in it. I think there's big money in the fights in the UK. I think there's big money even in like a, a David Price fight with him. I think that's that's a good fight. I've been saying that for ages that it's a good fight. I think Del Boy can win that fight. I think there's good money in that. I think, of course, the biggest one of all is the Dillian White rematch, but I don't really think Dillian White really I wouldn't be advising him to take that fight if I was if I was you know the guy giving the advice because I think that was way too close to call so um that's a real banana skin losing to Chisora can really mess your career up so um yeah I think there's a lot of fights for him that he could take I do want to see him avenge this loss I suppose because he never should have even lost in the first place but yeah it's a, it's a weird one I mean hopefully it's back on or if not hopefully he can get something going on because he's definitely got a few more fights left in him Del Boy he can really roll back the clock at times and put on good performances but no we're big fans of him so we wish him all the very best in the future of course Danny White has been forced to pull out his heavyweight clash with Marius Wack after suffering a foot injury in training yeah it was um, it was going to be a big bill at the O2 arena in um well two weeks oh no sorry a week i think it, yeah two weeks this saturday so um so yeah you know it's it's a shame really because it was shaping up to be quite a good show there was a few prospects on the bill i think isaac chamberlain was going to be getting out again you know he's a friend of the show of course and um the whole show's been cancelled so it's a shame but i've i never really thought that marius Wack was a great opponent for dillian white that's a fight that a hundred percent goes the distance wack has got a great chin dillian white's not the biggest banger so um you know, I didn't really think that fight was a great fight stylistically, but, you know, I do want to see him back out again, especially against someone a little bit, you know, someone with a little bit more stock than, than Wack. Not not many people know Wack apart from the hardcore, so, um, yeah, hopefully we see it rescheduled, we see him in action, and hopefully the injury is not too serious. I remember he actually, he, he actually kind of, I don't want to say, I don't want to give him the whole credit, but I remember we did, we did a show with, um, with Dillian White, like it was one of the first shows we ever did, and uh, it was it was it was in December of 2015. It was on the week of the Joshua fight, and he came on the show and he was just brilliant. Like he was completely golden, you know. Like he was completely the trash talking, what he was saying about Joshua, and our views for that show went through the roof. Like it was one of the best shows we ever did, and Spike O'Sullivan was on there as well on the week of fighting the uh, the Chris Eubank Jr. fight. So it was a great, great show. That's one for the archives there. But no, yeah, um, we wish Dillian White, of course, the very best with the future. And um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what's next for him. Is there any more news for us, Ayaz? Uh, no, that's it, Joey. Okay, my friend. Yeah, so um, we actually, I, I actually just want to dedicate this little part of the show here to. Um, 
a post that we put up on our Instagram page where we basically put out a list of fights that we'd like to see. Um, and many, many, many fighters got involved in it. You know, we tagged all the fighters in the posts, fights that we'd like to see across all weight divisions, from heavyweight all the way down to uh, down to flyweight, I believe. So there's so many fights on there. So if you want to head over to our Instagram page and have a little look, you can again interact with us, leave your comments, tell us what fights you'd like to see, or perhaps comment on the fights that we've put out there and uh, have your say. Let us know who you think will win that fight or anything. So any interactions on the Instagram page. We can talk about them on next week's show, of course. So just, as I say, head over to the Instagram page and you can find us on there at Box Hard Podcast. And there's there's many, many fights. There's probably something like 50-odd fantasy, not fantasy fights, because they're fights between fighters that are in their peaks right now. Great fights from all levels. So check it out. We've, we've made like a little section for the domestic fights and also for the world level fights. So it's really interesting. As I said, we've had loads of fighters commenting on it from um, Jorge Linares to to Kubrat Pulev many of them have have liked what we've you know some of the fights that we've set up so you can head over to there and have a little look if you wish but that's really it for the news that's it for that little interesting part I just threw out there we're now going to move over to the previewing of course the start of part two so we're going to start with a card that's happening on Thursday the 18th of May this Thursday so later tonight it's happening over in the US at the Casino del Sol which means the Sun Casino which is very good over in Tucson Arizona USA a couple of fights mentioned on this bill really couple of prospects uh starting off with joshua franco he's a prospect out of the garcia gym his record at the moment nine and oh he's in a six rounder at super flyweight his opponent yet to be announced also on the show um unbeaten prospect at super lightweight hector tanahara he's in a six rounder his opponent yet to be announced as well i just want to give a special shout out to hector tanahara he had to climb off the floor in his last fight which you know that will pay dividends for the future he got up off the floor and won the bout also jonathan navarro's on this bill he's in a six rounder at super lightweight his record at the moment nine and oh he takes on ricardo alan fernandez who has a record of three and four with three draws uh, four draws, sorry. And also, top of the bill, a great fight, actually. Diego De La Hoya, that's the cousin of Oscar De La Hoya. His record at the moment, 17-0. He takes on Eric Ruiz, who has a record of 16-6 and with one draw. And Eric Ruiz has been in there against some seriously good fighters. It's a 10-rounder, that one, at Super Bantamweight. Um... You know, some sometimes on this show we mention a load of guys, and people probably think, "Who are these guys?" Believe me, you're going to know about these guys in the near future. They are definitely promising prospects. Moving over now to the Barclay Card Arena in Hamburg, Germany. One fight or two fights mentioned on this bill, or three fights actually. We're going to start with the undercard, Mario Dacer. I don't know too much about him, but his record is 12 and 0, so it's a perfect record. Um, this one's at cruiserweight for the vacant international boxing organization, so the IBO international cruiserweight title, and also the vacant WBO European cruiserweight titles are on the line as well. He takes on our very own forgotten cruiserweight, Ola Afalabi. I believe he's from Streatham, but he lives in the U.S., he actually retired, but he's back. So this is his first fight back. I think he's been out the ring now for, oh, I'd have to take a guess, but it's been over a year. His record, 22-5 and five with four draws. Afalabi's a tough, tough guy, so this is going to be a real test for Mario Dassa. Also on the bill, Christian Hammer. He's, again, another man that we talked about in our Instagram page. He's another guy we'd like to see matched up. Christian Hammer, 21-4. and four. He takes on Zin Adin Bekmalov. I don't know a thing about him, but his record is... 22 and 5 with one draw. Um, he's for Christian Hammer's WBO European heavyweight title. Christian Hammer's actually a good fighter, by the way, so uh, it'd be interesting to see what unfolds there, but I definitely think he'll probably get the job done. And also on this bill, uh, top of the bill, of course, Igor Mikhalkin, who has a record of 19 and 1. I'm probably saying that wrong. He takes on Thomas. Utstenzine, who has a record of 27-0 and with two draws. It's for the vacant IBO World Light Heavyweight title. Um, both guys really need to fight someone. They really do. They're both kind of, you know, the, the records are a little bit padded here. But um, it's a fight that has to be mentioned, to be completely honest. But yeah, made a best man win over there. Uh, moving over now to the UK. This one, one fight to mention at the Bolton Whites Hotel in Bolton, if you haven't guessed, Lancashire, United Kingdom. 
a couple of fights to mention on this bill actually. Uh, top of the bill, Zelfa Flash Barrett, sixteen and O. We've seen him fight a few weeks back. I think it was probably about maybe about a month ago. And Zelfa Barrett is actually fighting a guy by the name of Eusebio Usejo, who's got a record of twenty eight and twenty. Now, if you look at this record, twenty eight and twenty, he's actually fought some seriously good fighters. He's fought. Evgeny Gradovich, he's fought, he's got a draw with Kiko Martinez, who we mentioned earlier. He's fought Oleg Malinovsky, who's still unbeaten. Um, he's also fought Rene Alvarado. He's fought, he's fought, you know, a long list of guys, some great fighters as well. He's fought Jezreel Corrales, who's, you know, right now he's a, uh, you know, he's a world champion, WBA. Also, he's fought Johnny Gonzalez, the you know the, the the great Mexican fighter that was fantastic for years. So he's really, really mixed it with some great fighters as well. So um, we've got a you know we can't overlook him. He's obviously a decent fighter. He's obviously been round and fought some great guys. But um, it's a bit of a hard one, really. This for for Zelfa Barrett. He's you know it's it's a bit of a test. I mean, he is. We do have to remember he is actually sixteen and zero with ten knockouts. So he's doing all the right things, but. You know, he didn't look overly great against Ross Jameson in his last fight. I'm looking at that now. That was actually just over a month ago, about five weeks ago. He got the job done, but, you know, he really he didn't look overly impressive. But, no, we're, we're definitely behind Flash Barrett for sure. We hope he gets the job done, but it's going to be a good little show, that. I like them them hotel shows. They do look good. Um, also on the bill, Luke Blackledge. He's out again. His record at the moment, 22-3 and three with two draws. His opponent yet to be announced. And the return of Haroon Khan, the brother, of course, of um, Amir Khan. He's been out the ring, if I'm not mistaken, since 2014. So it's been like almost... It's been almost three years. So, um... I really don't know what he's been doing for money in that time. I mean, I suppose, you know, being Amir Khan's brother, money's probably not an issue. But, yeah, he's, you know, he's. I don't really understand what it was all about. He just he just gave up boxing for, like, three years. I mean, he's kept himself in decent shape. But we really need to see what's going on there because, you know, he's the forgotten man, so to speak. So, so I want to know if he's actually any good or not because we really still don't know. He hasn't really fought anybody of note yet, but he's back again. His opponent yet to be announced. And also the final fight on this bill, um, heavyweight contender, I suppose, Alexander Ustinov. His record at the moment, 33-1. and one. I am a little bit sceptical of if this fight's actually going to happen. His opponent's yet to be announced, but he's been supposed to have been on a few bills, and he hasn't ended up fighting, so I'm not quite sure the reason behind that, but we wish Alexander Ustinov all the very best over in the Bolton White's Hotel. That's it for the Bolton White's Hotel. Moving over now to another hotel, this one over in Glasgow, Scotland, the Crown Plaza. One fight to mention over here, cruiserweight Stephen Simmons. He's a pretty exciting fighter, I suppose. His record at the moment, 15-2. and two. His opponent yet to be announced. Those fights that we've just mentioned there are happening on Friday. I, of course, also mentioned you know a couple fights, the prospects, Diego De La Hoya, etc. That is for Thursday. Um... So, yeah, moving over now to Saturday, the 20th of May. We're going to start with one fight over in Japan. Friend of the show, he was on last week's show, of course. Hassan and Dam. He takes on Ryoto Murata. This one's for the vacant WBA world middleweight title. Hassan and Dam, 35-2. and Murata, 12-0, and of course. The former gold medalist at the Olympics. It's, again, it's over in Japan, so it's... You know, it's the first time Hassan has travelled to Asia. We wish him the very, very best. We truly do. We love Hassan on this show. That's it for Japan. Moving over now to the big bill happening this weekend. Really the best bill, probably, of the weekend, especially in the UK. Top of the bill, Javante Davis, 17-0. and He takes on Liam Walsh, 21-0. and It's for the IBF World Super Featherweight title, Javante Davis being the champion. Oh, yes, this is a fantastic fight. We know that Liam Walsh is a guy that... Many people overlook, many people underrate him. They say that this is not an easy fight for for Javante Davis, but pretty much everybody that I've spoken to anyway doesn't give him a chance in this fight. I think it's a lot closer than that, but we do have to remember Javante Davis looked absolutely amazing in the job he did over Pedraza. Yes, Javante Davis did extremely very, he did very good against Pedraza, but Liam Walsh, I'll tell you something, yeah, this is going to be a very good fight. But I tell you what, if I'm going to go for a knockout, I'm going to have to go with Javonta Davis because of the experience. Not, I mean, not the experience, but he's very, he's a very good and dangerous southpaw. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a good fight. We we definitely hope so. Liam Walsh, as I say, this is his time to shine. He's a man that 
I don't know, he's a little bit shy, I suppose. He's not on social media, as far as I know. He's he's pretty much quiet. He does things behind closed doors. And, um, you know, he's, he's he's a quiet guy. But also, Javante Davis, he is a guy who I think is a pretty shy guy as well. I think he's the quiet killer. So, um, it's a great, great fight. Both men, not... Um, you know, they're quiet guys, and I don't want you to get me wrong. Javante Davis, he can be loud at times. He can say things, but... He's he's not naturally like that. I think he's he's pretty relaxed, and I think Liam Walsh is is exactly that. So it's going to be a good fight. Both men, um, you know, very composed. Javante Davis, obviously, we've seen him on that world level. We've seen him compete there. It's only been the one fight. We have to admit, it's only that fight against Pedraza, which I actually thought Pedraza was probably favourite in that fight. I thought Pedraza was actually going to win that fight. In in honest truth, um, you know, we spoke to Javante. I remember the, the week of that fight. So. Yeah, it's um, it's intriguing, really. Was it just a good performance by Javante on that one-off chance? Was it or was it not? We're going to have to see here. But Liam Walsh definitely coming to win, and it's going to be a great fight. This is his time to shine, no doubt. But, um, yeah, we're going to leave that one there. It's going to be a cracking fight. We're going to try and get through the rest of these fights as quick as possible now. Brother of Liam Walsh, Ryan Walsh, he's on the bill as well. He fights for the British featherweight title against Marco McCulloch. Ryan Walsh, 21-2 and two with one draw. Marco McCulloch, 17-3. and three. That should be a decent little scrap there. Joe Pigford's on the bill as well. He's at the moment 12-0. and 0. He takes on Aaron Morgan, who's also 12-0. and 0. That should be a good scrap at super welterweight. Um... Chris Hobbs, the Southern Area light heavyweight champion. He puts his belt on the line against the beast, Anthony Yard, another friend of the show. His record 10-0. and Chris Hobbs 6-1 and with one draw. I'm expecting Yard to get the job done, probably another knockout. It's a 10-rounder though, so it'd be good if it does go a few rounds. I'd like to see Anthony Yard in some of those later rounds. He definitely is a talent. Another friend of the show. I say friend of the show. We're going to be speaking to him very soon, actually. Uh, probably next week's show. Archie Sharp, a man that I like to watch. He's a good prospect. He, at the moment, is 7-0. and He takes on Tamas Lasker, who has a record of 19-14. and He's been in there with some decent guys, Lasker as well, so a good learning fight this one should be for Archie Sharp. Hopefully it all goes well for him. It's a sixth round of that one at lightweight. Mitchell Smith's supposed to be on the bill as well. His record at the moment, 14-1. and His opponent yet to be announced. He was a guy that was, you know, on a bit of a roll until he ran into George Jupp and hasn't really seemed to get going since then. It's been a bit stop-start for him, I think, maybe a few injuries, but that's a 10-rounder at lightweight. Moving down the bill once again, Boyd Jones Jr. gets out against Norbert Kaluksa, who has a record of 14-9. and nine. Boyd Jones Jr., 11-1 and one with one draw. If I'm not mistaken, it's his first fight back since losing his O. I may be wrong. But uh, Boy Jones is, you know, he's he's a good guy. We wish him all the very best. Sanjeev Sohota, his record at the moment six and zero. He takes on Stephen Blackhouse, who has a record of one and five. Sohota will get the job done, but he he likes to kind of make it hard for himself. I don't really know why, but he seems to always be in competitive fights, even though they shouldn't be. So that should always. Be a good watch, for sure. Daniel Dubois on the bill as well. He's pretty much destroying everybody that gets in his way at the moment. 19 years old, and the man is on fire. His record at the moment, 2-0. and His opponent yet to be announced. Also, a few other guys on the bill. Their opponents haven't been finalised yet, but we're going to give them a mention as well. Sammy McNess, 6-0. and He gets out again. Uh, West Ham supporting... Uh, prospect there, good fighter. Larone Richards, we know about him. He's at the moment 6-0 and as well. He gets out again. A uh, you know a good light heavyweight prospect. Lucian Reed's on the bill. Again, his record 5-0. and And Sonny Edwards, 3-0. and Friend of the show, he gets out again as well. I think his opponent's pulled out. So they're going to be trying to get some sort of last-minute opponent for Sonny Edwards on the bill. Hopefully they get it done. Uh, that's it for that one. Moving over now to the US. There's a couple of bills over in the US that we've got to mention. Firstly, the MGM National... National Harbour in Oxon Hill, Maryland. Gary Russell Jr. puts his WBC World Featherweight title on the line against Oscar Iskandon. His record 25 and 2, and Gary Russell 27 and 1. Um, Gary Russell's a man that's been very inactive of late. He has, to be completely honest. I can't really believe that the WBC have not stripped him because his inactivity has been pretty mad. But um, 
he's a phenomenal talent. He could be the best featherweight in the division, to be honest. His only loss was to Lomachenko, and you know he's he's fantastic. He's got some of the fastest hands in the sport as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing him back in action. I think he will completely walk through Escandon. I think he's got way too much for him, but it's going to be good to see him showcase his skills once again. Also on the bill for the interim IBF World Super Middleweight title, Andre Durrell, of course, 25-2. and two. Those two losses, one to James Degau in most recent times and one to Carl Froch. Uh, he takes on Jose Uskatsky, who has a record of 26-1. and one. That is a fantastic fight. Mark my words, that's a great, great fight. Uskatsky is a good fighter. That one is a real 50-50. Also on the bill, Rancis Barflimi, his record at the moment, 25-0, and 0, of course. A, uh, well, he's at super lightweight now, but he was at lightweight before, if I'm not mistaken. He is a great, great fighter. He is a southpaw Cuban. He takes on former opponent of Ricky Burns, Kirill Relic. I'm not sure if Relic is still associated with Ricky Hatton, but he gave Ricky Burns all he could handle. It was a really close fight. Scorecards were a little bit wide, but uh, Relic, we know he's a good fighter, and Barfleme definitely needs to be on his A-game to win this one. Um, if I'm not mistaken, also, Gary Russell Jr.'s brother is on this bill as well. I think his name's also Gary Russell, so... He makes his debut on this bill as well, so we're going to mention that as well. Moving over now from the MGM National Harbour over to the Madison Square Gardens, the MSG, New York City, United States of America, of course. Um, there's two fights really to mention on this bill. We're going to start with the undercard. Raimundo Beltram, 32-7 and with one draw. He looked unbelievable in his last fight. He takes on Jonathan Marcelo. This one's for the vacant WBA International Lightweight title, also the NABF Lightweight title and the WBO NABO Lightweight title. Uh, Marcelo's record's 25-2. and two. It, should be a, it should be a good fight. I haven't really seen Marcelo fight, but Beltran, he's always in pretty good fights, to be completely honest. He's a guy that I really feel should have been a world champion, but... You know, he seems to be electric. In his last fight, he looked absolutely brilliant. So I hope he does get another crack at the title. But it's just a case of who will it be against. We're not too sure. And topping the bill, one of the best fighters in the world, actually, pound for pound. I was going to say in his weight class, he's definitely more than that. Terence Crawford, 30-0, and 0, perfect record. He puts his WBC and WBO world super lightweight titles on the line against Felix Diaz. Felix Diaz, 19-1, and 1, obviously a former Olympic gold medalist as well. Good Amateur pedigree, good pro record as well. He's beaten some top guys, Felix Diaz, but this should be a great fight. But in my honest opinion, I think Terence Crawford overwhelms him. Terence Crawford, obviously, as I said, one of the best fighters in the sport, to be completely honest. I think he's got way too much for Felix Diaz. I want to see Terence Crawford in there with Mikey Garcia. That's a great, great fight. But um, no, this should be pretty good. The undercard's not the best, but um, you know, it's always good to see Terence Crawford out again because he is a real special talent, as I said. And and uh, we wish him all the very best. We just want to see him in those big fights. Or we can see him move up to 147, and there's a lot for him there, that's for sure. Also on this bill, I almost forgot a uh, a second pro outing for Shakur Stevenson, who's a fantastic prospect. Uh, he gets out again. He takes on Carlos Gaston Suarez, who has a record of 6-3 and three with two draws. God help him. He's in for a beating for sure. Shakur Stevenson, an unbelievable talent. And that's really it for that one. Moving over now to the Laredo Energy Arena in Texas, USA. One fight to mention over here. Um, possible future world champion. Really talented David Benavidez. His record at the moment, 17-0. and He takes on Rogelio Porky Medina, former opponent of James DeGaulle, who has a record of 37-7. and James DeGaulle didn't have it all his own way in that fight as well. I remember that. This one's at super middleweight. It's a 12 rounder. So David Benavidez, it'll be interesting to see how he deals with Medina because it was a decent fight against the gal there. And uh, that's it for that one. That's it for Saturday. There's one fight to mention on Sunday, the 21st of May, this Sunday. One fight I'm going to mention over in Japan, Tokyo. Naoa Inoue, 12-0. He takes on Ricardo Rodriguez, 16-3. Inoue puts his WBO World Super Flyweight title on the line. Listen, Inoue is one of the best fighters in world boxing. He's a fantastic, fantastic fighter. Um, I believe he's got a brother as well who's a very good fighter too. I'm not 
completely clued up on some of the lower weights. I will hold my hands up to that. But from what I've heard, Inoue is absolutely brilliant. So keep your eyes peeled for that. That should be a cracker. And that really wraps up the preview. And we've tried our best to go through it as quick as we could. There's so many fights on. It's going to be a big show next week as well because there's going to be so many fights to review. But as for the preview, and we've gone through it as quick as we could. Some brilliant boxing over this week. And I hope that you've enjoyed the show so far. But remember, there's one last thing to do before we wrap it up. We've done the review and we've done the preview and we did the news. We mentioned the Instagram thing, of course. And we spoke to Josh Kelly. So the last thing to do before we wrap up the show is to speak to one more guest. It's time to welcome guest number two. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former WBA super featherweight champion of the world, Mr. Jason Sosa. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's my pleasure, my friend. So firstly, Jason, you fought a few weekends back, and we're going to get on to that in just a moment. Um, your WBA belt wasn't on the line against Lomachenko. You'd already vacated the belt, to my understanding. What actually happened there? It was a bit confusing for me to understand. Yeah, no, it was confusing for the whole team, actually. Um, you know, we, we went to Puerto Rico for training camp for two months, and I believe we was a month in, and then... Uh, you know, they pretty much told me if I don't fight Corrales, I got to vacate the belt. Well, I'm already in training camp and getting ready for Lomachenko. So, um, you know, we decided as a team, you know, uh, we got a be- uh, bigger fight. And uh, we just uh, let the belt go. That's a shame there. Do you feel hard done by it, by the WBA there? Um, I was at first, but then, you know, you got to understand this, boss- this boxing is the business of it. Um, you know, there's nothing you can do. Um, but at the end of the day, I was, you know, it was a pleasure for me to fight for the such a beautiful belt at the WBA. And, uh, you know, we have uh, a lot of more belts out there to fight for. Yeah, we see a lot of the sanctioning bodies doing this kind of stuff. When when there's already been a fight set up and, you know, two guys are contracted to fight and then all of a sudden they come in with this random rule and end up stripping people. It's, it's not right in my opinion, but it is what it is. Okay, so as I mentioned, you fought a few weeks back against Vasyl Lomachenko for his WBO Super Featherweight World title. Now, I've got to be honest, Jason, you did impress me with your lateral movement. I've never seen Lomachenko miss as much as he did. I know, obviously, he landed a lot of shots too, but I think you your elusive work and your ability to avoid being pinned down by one of the best fighters in the world will pay dividends against some of the other guys in your weight category. What did you make of the fight, Jason? Some say Lomachenko is the best pound-for-pound fighter in the world. He's obviously a tough man to beat. How did it feel sharing the ring with him? Uh, it was amazing. It was a beautiful experience. Um, you know, Lomachenko is very special. Uh, you can't take that away from him. He's been doing this since a kid. Since he was a kid, and uh, he got one of the best trainers, you know, as of today as well, and that's his father. Um, but um, yeah, Lomachenko and 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 the fight, it was a beautiful experience to uh, to, have to um, you know, uh, get to. Uh, I have gotten um, able to share the ring with such a great fighter like Lomachenko. And he tried a few little, there was little bits of kidology he was doing, like he, he tried to do the matador thing. Is that stuff that, you know, some fighters get wound up by that? Did that affect your game at all? No, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, you know, we, we prepare ourselves. Uh, we did, we might we might have did a little bit too much in training camp. Um, that's how you saw it at the end of the fight, you know, at the end of other rounds. The first two, three rounds, I was doing good, and then just the body just gave up. There was no more left in me. And I want to ask you, Jason, does Lomachenko hit hard, or is it the accumulation of shots that can be overwhelming for fighters to take? Uh, he doesn't hit, hit hard at all. Is Well, then again, you're asking me, who you shouldn't be asking, because I'm kind of... Uh, you know, I don't have a glass jaw. I pretty could take a pretty hard shot. You know, <laughs> actually spar with like 160 pounders. So, at the end of the day, um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I don't, th- I don't believe it's a shot. I mean, the power. I believe that is uh, all the shots that he throws. Man, he's like nonstop. He throws, you know, many shots and in different angles. And uh, he's very excited, man. Lomachenko is is, is great. 
Yeah, and obviously your father pulled you out of the fight at the end of round nine, and I think that was the only way Lomachenko was going to get the stoppage. As you said, you got a good chin, and I don't think he would have been able to knock you out. Um, do you agree with that? And are you frustrated that you wasn't able to go the distance, or were you happy that your father pulled you out? It's a bit of a strange question, I suppose. Um, at the end of the day, you know, you can see what I don't see. I'm a fighter. I'm going to fight to the end. And um, if he felt that I couldn't continue, then I I agree with his decision 100%. Um, I'm not going to fight him to it, and especially that I knew that you know I, I couldn't continue. I had no more left in me. Um, so he's right. You know, I, there was no need for me to take uh, as many shots. You know, but yeah, I mean at the end of the day, he sees uh, he sees what I don't see. So I gotta go. Oh, he he depends. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. Absolutely. He's obviously there for a reason. Um, I mean, before the final round, he did say to you, you know, if you don't show me anything in this round, I'm going to pull you out. And you did you did fight pretty well in that final round, I thought. I think, you, if, I, if I can remember correctly, I think you caught Lomachenko with a good left hook in that round. Yeah, I did. I did. I remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, it's, it's still early. Jason, it's still fresh in the air. Um, do, you, do you know at all at this stage what's next for yourself? I'm not sure. I mean, uh, after this defeat, after this ex- beautiful experience, uh, I grew from it. You know, uh, I took it, you know, the right way, the, the way we all fighters should take it. Um, at the end of the day, I got in the ring with one of the best. And I really feel deep, deep down inside that I actually just graduated, you know, to bigger and better things. Uh, I'm very, very excited. You know, um, I'm taking a little vacation now, but when I get back, it's time to go to the gym and time to learn some new stuff and, you know, just keep continuing. And I would love to be a world champion again. I'm very, very happy to hear you talk like that because that's the best thing that a defeat can do. You know, to learn from defeats is so important. Now, um, as I said, you, you're not really too sure which way you're going to turn at the moment, but have you got your eye on anybody in the in the, in the division, anybody that you'd like to fight at all? Um, I I want to fight whoever, man. I mean, I never, <laughs> you know, I, I never back down on the fight. Uh, I would love to be a world champion, like I said. Any world champion that are interested to just, you know, giving me another shot, uh, I'm willing to take it. And, um, you know, that's that's our goal is just to fight the best. At the end of the day, you know, I don't want to I, I don't want to go back down. You know, I don't want to fight easy fights. I want to continue with hard fights because at the end of the day, this is what boxing is all about. The best fighting the best. And that's how I feel right now. And coming down to the last couple of questions now, Jason, Javante Davis congratulated you after the fight, but then had a bit of a run-in with your friend, and a friend of the show, actually, Tevin Farmer. Uh, We've had him on here a couple of times now. What was all that about, and who do you think would win that fight, Tevin Farmer and Javante Davis? (laughs) Yeah, I saw saw that. Uh, It was was great, man. You know, know, when I came out of defeat, and and people was coming up to me, and uh, Davis was one of them. You know, uh, I can't I can't do any more than than to grab him and just you know give him a hug and tell him you know what congratulations man because David is like one of us he's he's like Tevin he's like me he's like us what I mean about saying that is that we came from nothing you know at the end of the day we came from nothing people turn their backs on us and um, we we actually made our name of ourselves on our own. So it's a big deal, and um, you know that's what I did. You know, I congratulated him, and I wished him nothing but the best. Um, other than a fight with my brother Tim Farmer, I mean, it, it, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you uh, who you, who I think is gonna win. You know, who's gonna win. Like I can't just say, uh, you know, Tim is my my brother. I'm not gonna say David's gonna win. Of course not. But Tevin, uh I mean, uh, Tevin is just a special, talented fighter. He, you just don't know what Tevin's going to show up, man. And he's just very, very talented and experienced. You know, sometimes most fighters, uh, nowadays most fighters want to have an undefeated record. And, um, you know, Tevin doesn't have that. What Tevin has is uh, experience. And, um, you know, he's, he's a complete fighter at the end of the day. He might have four losses. 
but those four losses may hit to who he is today, and uh, he's uh, he's special. Yeah, he definitely is, but may the best man win if they ever do fight. I want to ask you, Jason, as well, do you watch the sport a lot? Are you a fan of boxing as well as a competitor? Are there any fights that you're looking forward to that are coming up at all? Uh, to be honest, I'm really, really not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, a fan of it. I mean, I, I'm a fan to certain fighters, and, and I do watch here and there. And I like going to, uh, you know, fight to see them live. Um but at the end of the day, yeah, uh, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't wait for the days or, you know, who fighting, who's it? Nah, I don't do that. Okay, I just uh, focus enough. on myself. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. That's the best way anyway. And as you mentioned now, I can't help but ask you now, you said that you sparred with some guys that are 160. Um, you know, I wanted to really ask you, which guys have you sparred with? Any big names that we may know from over here at all, Jason? What, well, um... I don't know if you know uh, Julius Williams. Yeah, 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 of course. The one that fought uh, Charlo. I, yeah, that's I right. Yeah, J-Rock, J-Rock, yeah. Uh, yeah, J-Rock. I spar him. I spar uh, Thomas Lamana. Um, you know, these are all heavy guys. You yeah. know, uh, I spar other heavy guys that, you know, I'm not sure where they're at now, but um, I spar heavy, heavy guys. Yeah, no, that's that's brilliant, man. That's absolutely brilliant. And the final two questions now for you, Jason. This one is a question I like to ask everybody that we speak to from overseas. From any era, you don't have to give us one if you don't have one, but have you got any kind of favorite UK fighter from any era? They can still be boxing now. They can be way retired. Any era. Today era, I like uh, uh, Anthony Joshua. Yeah. A kid is special. I like him. <laughs> yeah, he certainly is. He certainly is. Did you manage to watch his fight with Klitschko? I watched a little bit of it. I really did. You know, I just tell you I don't watch fights, but I caught a little bit of it. I mean, it was intense. You know, you got two, one of the best heavyweight fighters in the world going against each other. Yeah. Yeah, definitely was something special. But no, he's a, he definitely is a real talent. And the final thing now for you, um, for you, Jason, it's not really a question, but it's just really an opportunity to send out a message to any of your listeners, any of your supporters here in the UK. There's a lot of guys over here that have got a lot of love for yourself. So if you've got a message to send out to any UK fans of yours, please do so. Uh, to all my fans and uh, to all my supporters and brothers, uh, I thank you. I appreciate the love, and um, you know I will continue doing great, uh, do great things, so you guys can keep on following uh, my dream, my story. And um, thank you, man. God bless. Okay, listen, Jason. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time. Best of luck with the future, and I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Thank you. Okay, now it's time to conclude episode 83 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as Sumra has been I as Sumra. A special thank you to our two guests on this week's show, the super talented Olympian and unbeaten pro Josh Kelly and the former WBA super featherweight champion of the world, Jason Sosa. Also, we'd like to send a special shout out to some of our loyal listeners, namely Rob Gotti, Danny Biggs and WGE Music. This show has been a pleasure to create for all of you please remember to leave a review on itunes if you get a chance we'll be back next week with another big show as always until next time take care